episode 27, two years later, which is the first time ever in a Sentai having a big time skip mid-season. But considering our villains were defeated last episode, it's like you're entering season two, and this is a one-season show, especially when we get our new villains. Speaking of which, this is the first time since Gosager where we have a rotation in villains. This time, our t antagonist... I'm sorry, my mind blanked out for a moment. But this time, our antagonists are the space bug gestures. And while we're at it, Kami Gem is still alive and actually rolls with this crew. His cohorts being Guma the Shady, Hillbill the Enticing, Minogog the Concealed, and their leader, Space Bug King, Dagdad Dujardin. How do the Japanese even say that and not think, whoa, what a name? Writers, man, they come up with stuff. And these guys are gods. Like, they all serve under Dagdad, but they are all gods. In their first episode, they treat our heroes like it's a walk in the park. And these guys are the reasons for Chiku's history, why the Bugnarok started attacking humans, all because of them. Like, these gods, when you see their base of operations, it's the universe. Like, it's one big room in the middle of space, but it's the universe. Planets are the size of toy globes, because they're actually giants. It's just... This is what one thinks of when they think of gods. And like what I first said, in the first episode, well, in their first episode, it was like a walk in the park to them, flexing their powers. Now, why are intergalactic gods our villains? Because it's all a game to them. The humans and the Bugnarok were supposed to kill each other, but obviously that didn't happen. So Dagdead came to clean house. Meaning kill everything. And there's also a subplot I haven't mentioned up to now because I was waiting for it to have more meat to it. And that's the God's Wrath incident. 15 years ago, a swarm of locusts raided Chiku and most importantly, put our rulers into power. Originally, Rita's dad was accused of killing their mom until forensics proved him innocent. But in episode 30, we meet the real criminal behind God's Wrath, Grody Lacodium, aka Kosei Amano, aka Common Rider Garen, aka the Libra Zodiacs from Forze, aka the Fifth Gesture, last time. And ultimately, he was responsible for killing Himino's parents. But let's start back at the beginning. Rita and Himino are together, and Chief Karansu appears, freezing Ishibana. This so happens to be Grody's doing, because, first off, Karanzu is dead. After God's Wrath, Chief Karanzu used a special technique to imprison Grody and herself in ice. Recently, Kamijen found them and killed Rita's mom. Karanzu, the Karanzu we see is a zombie brought to life by Grody. Grody's a sadistic case. All he's concerned about is longing to die. And before anyone makes the connection, Juzo from Shinkenger wanted to die, but he, but he wanted to go out more in fashion. This guy, on the other hand, would jump off of a roof to see if it'll kill him. And he gets creepier because he can reanimate the dead. And spoiler alert, he does that multiple times. And so, episode 31's technically a, a filler episode. But what's important is how the episode ends. Dag Dead says screw it and sends everyone to a different planet. Little did he know, he sent everyone to Earth. Episodes 32 and 33... It's the two-part Kyoruger team-up, done to celebrate Kyoruger's 10th anniversary. 
first off, I like the concept. Mainly the connection between the two shows being a 10 year difference. Because Kyoto Ujiro came out in 2013 and this show mostly aired in 2023. And that's not the only connection. There's also familiar relations between Dag Dead and Day Boss. 10 years after the events of Kyoto Ujiro, Dag Dead came to Earth and teamed up with a remnant of Day Boss to suck the brave out of everyone. King and Uchi leave for space to hunt Dag Dead. Because their actors were only available for voiceover work and not be there. And the rest of... Okay, not the rest of the Kyodujers, just Ian, Nosan, Soji, and Amy are there. And left the power to defend Earth. The King Ojers in this are stranded on Earth as it's invaded again by Dayboss. But everyone except Gira can't morph. For Gira, it's explained later, but for everyone else, they can't morph. And so... For anyone who's watching this video right now, who has seen Kyoruger, and ships Daigo and Amy, well, congratulations, they had a kid, who came from the future and is in this special, and I hope that in the Kyoruger King Oger team up, they get an explanation as to why and how he came here from the future, but... Daigo and Amy's son, his name is Daigoro or, or Prince, whichever name you want to call him. Uh, him and Gira are the only ones who could morph in this episode. Yama makes him a specialized Gabri Caliber after he breaks his. And he can morph into a King Oger styled Kyoruger called King Kyorudad. Now, I want to talk about this suit. And how it genuinely looks awesome. One thing I've actually have grown tired from. Or at least no. One thing I don't like. Well no. One thing I didn't like from the Zenkaiger Dawn Brothers team up. And is something we're going to see again in the Dawn Brothers King Oger team up. Swapping up powers. So that each. So that the usually the Red Rangers or the Leader Rangers. Would resemble the other. I don't like that, and I don't get the point of that. Here, it gets a pass because it's actually meant to be a completely separate ranger. Like, it's basically Kyoru Red, but stylized in K King Ozier. And honestly, it looks nice. And I think it, what makes it look nice is because it's a bit more royal and less rambunctious as Kyoru Carnival. Which, by the way... The Kyoto Carnival helmet here with the feathers, I guess, on it. I don't know, it works with this suit. Probably because it's not so loud. But while we're talking about King Kyoto Dead, I also want to talk about his specialized Garbu Caliber. Not a big fan of how it looks. It's just the sword that the other Kyoto just have, but it's painted red. And it looks like he has stickers ripped off it. But that's all. It's just... Not really much, but I do like this suit, and it does look awesome. It's interesting seeing Kyoruger, well, different from looking like something from Kyoruger. Ultimately, I like these two episodes. I enjoy seeing the characters interact, and I love how much they tie both shows together, because surprisingly, the King Oger's ancestors came from Earth. Whatever conflict there was back then... Whatever humans got on the Caucasus Kabuto Castle, which could also be a spaceship, traveled to a different planet and lived there. <laughs> Funny thing about this, when I was watching this episode, I was thinking to myself for a moment, like, I want to make so many Christopher Columbus jokes and think of something. But we learn later that the Bugnarok also came from another planet too, because of Dag Dead. So, humans, Bugnaroks, doesn't matter. In some shape or form, we're all colonizers. <laughs> uh, not like no, I'm not singing the song. I'm not. So, the only one thing with this team up that's weird is how the Kyodujers got their powers back. If anyone remembers Kyodujer, their powers are tied to the Earth's melody. 
And what is the Earth's melody? It's basically their theme song. And as many times as they played it and heard it, they've sung it before. Like, in the finale, they literally hum their own theme song. No one ever thought to write down the composition in case shit like this happens again. Because all that happens is, Himino goes on the piano and plays it. How does she even know that song? And stuff like that has happened before in Kyoruja with the Earth's Melody. But this was the simplest resolution there could be. But everyone gets their powers back. The day is safe. Moving on. That resolution was just weird. And especially when they've run into the problem of losing the Earth's Melody before. They've hummed it before. No one could have thought of writing it down for a case of emergencies. But, episode 34, the Sentai comes back from Earth to find Chiku ruled by the Jesters and a man wearing a mask named Shugo Mask. And before going further, I want to say I like that they kept this realistic. And I mean the fact that it took them six months to get back to... No, well, on Chiku, it took them six months to get back there. But, theory of relativity, space travel is a lot longer than you think. So, six months here is like a couple hours or more up out in space. I like that that guy explained that it wasn't just... Power Rangers had us fooled for years thinking space travel was just, I don't know, a couple of minutes or whatever. Here, they're realistic. They said, no, like, here it's a lot longer. Out there, probably not. But, Shugo Mask, who by the end reveals that it's Raculous, now one of Dagdead's lackeys. For the next few episodes, the King Ogers are taking back each of their kingdoms, and I recommend watching those episodes. My personal favorite is Kagaragi's, because it involves him and the former Queen of Tofu, and I'll explain why in the character analysis. And so, episode 39, Niscopa is the second to last country to take back, and here is when the good guys make some progress. Up to now, they've driven the Jesters back in combat. But thanks to a hidden feature on their swords, they drew out a new power that's strong enough to kill the Jesters. And while Hillbill was the focus villain of the week, Guma is the first among them to die. It's weird how he dies, because he's a ninja. So, he should be fast enough to evade that final attack, but then it's shown that Hillbill used her mind control powers on Guma to save herself. It turns out, this was partially planned by Raculus to get into Dagdead's better graces, which he succeeds and is now a jester. Episode 40, we get another cameo from Daigoro. Yeah, a couple episodes back, Gabutera stowed away on the castle, and Dagro's been out looking for him, and his inclusion leads to an exclusive combination, King Kyoruzen. Looks fine. I kind of wish for this combination, Segogachi and Drysera were a part of it, because Gabutera's feet becoming the arms look bulky. And I like that we have a unique idea of what Kyoruzen would look like if five Zudanru combined together. So it just makes me think, oh, uh, what if Parasargon or Zapter were like either somewhere on the shoulders or made the feet or lower legs? Like just something at least. And Gabutera's feet went up and became knee pads. Like that's just something I thought of. Is it clean? Is it good? Eh, it was just a thought. And so after that cameo, Raculus and Dagdad drop a bomb on Shugadam. How is Gira the only one able to summon King Oger? And how was Gira the only one able to morph for half of the team up? Well, it turns out that Gira is the spawn of Dagdad. How is that possible? It's revealed later that the Husky family had served Dagdad for ages. 
And one day, Dagdad blessed the king and queen by impregnating the queen. So, Kira is Jesus. Can he walk on water? No. Can he turn water to wine? No. But he can be Lord of the Flies. But another highlight about this episode, too, along with that reveal, Dagdad reveals that he was the one who created the Shoe Gods. And shoot, after hearing the news about Gira, like, Dagdad controls Gira into summoning King Oger. And while King Oger does become formed, the Shoe Gods show to have will their own and resist. Gira's order, and therefore Dagdad's control, which is impressive. Episodes 41 and 42, Raculus and Gira battle once again. Gira loses, and before delivering a killing blow, Dagdad gives Raculus the power to kill an immoral being. <laughs> Carl, that kills people! Oh, oh, Carl. wow, I... I I didn't know that. How could you not know that? Yeah. Time for an explanation. As I said, the Huskies had been serving Dagdad for 2,000 years and eventually planned to retaliate. It was last passed down from Raculus's father to Raculus as a teenager. And around that time, the king had died and for his younger brother's safety, Raculus fed Gira a shoe god soul to give him amnesia and place him in an orphanage. During God's wrath, Dagdad made himself known to Raculus and made him work for him. It was then that Raculus decided to play double agent by being a tyrant. Everything that has happened up to now has all been conspired by Raculus, pushing things forward to stop Dagdad while other events were out of his control. The only thing that got in the way was Gira awakening his powers and constantly getting stronger. And for a while, Gira worked in Raculus's favor to avoid Dagdad's suspicions, and by surprise, Kagaragi and Suzume were in on it the entire time. Hell, how did Raculus survive after falling from who knows how high from a cliff? Well, he faked his own death. Suzume gave him a Romeo and Juliet style, I want to say poison, but... The point is, he Juliet himself and made himself fall, well, asleep and pretend dead. And so, this all happens, by the way, in episode 42. And with Kagaragi explaining all of this, to bounce off of Gira and Raculus fighting together and beating Dagdad for the first time. And so, episode 43... Raculus is held on trial for all of his crimes and conduct. Admittedly, it was all work towards a bigger plan, but a lot of people and Bugnrock were still collateral, and so he's sentenced to community service of helping the King Elders. Remember when Dagdad died last episode? Well, now he's back after rebirthing himself through Minagog. Sidebar, there are seven episodes left. Would he still get maternity leave? But I can see how he could have survived. Dagdad is what his design is based off of. A DNA larva in a suit? Kind of like Sargane from Hurricane So, episode 44. Raculus informs everyone of a way to defeat Dagdad by using hidden powers of each kingdom's heirlooms. The Oger Crown, Yanma's Earring, Himino's Tiara, Rita's Charm, Kagaragi's amulet and a stone signifying Jeremy's immortality, which, honest to God, never occurred to me that Jeremy was immortal. Like, yeah, I literally thought for a moment that he kind of lived and died like an orphanot, had to be killed. But it, and he talks about living for over 2,000 years, like almost all the time. But never thought of as to why, honestly. But apparently, Jeremy's embedded with a stone in his chest, 
also because of his mom. But moving on, each heirloom has uncontrollable power, but when working together, they manage to start killing off the generals. And I like how when when they kill off a general in an episode, it's two King Ogers working together. So, first it's Hillbill. Minogog gets imprisoned in ice. And in episodes 46 and 47, Grody's next to go. Grody turns out to be immortal. And a zombie brought to life by Dagdead to be a serial killer. And the only way to kill him is that Himino and Jeremy make him immortal through Jeremy's stone so they can kill him. I want to make a list of fucked up things I've seen in Sentai. Because after Grody dies, they show him suffering in hell. What the fuck? Like, I watched that on a Wednesday morning thinking these writers are dark. Like, m mind you, it wasn't all that bad. But it's what you realize what's happening to you is what shocks you.